Thank you, everybody. It's great to be here. Thank you, B&H. Thank you, Canon, and, and everybody that showed up today. Uh, what I want to talk about today is the power of versatility, which is really more about solutions, which is tips and tricks and different things I've learned over the years from working in a variety of working conditions, everything from big mountain expeditions to studio jobs to just run and gun journalism. And so I'm gonna just jump right in it so I can attempt to stay on time here, and I'm kind of foregoing any biography type of talk today. I wanted to open up with this, which is really just a snapshot of what I would consider to be a pretty versatile bag. So if I have to go out on a job where I know that I need to be nimble, I need to be fast, I need to have a variety of options, anything within this kit, this is kind of a good assembly for me to put in my bag, and I can whittle it down from there. So it's everything from using your standard primes from like, or your standard zooms, like a 15 to 35, 24 to 70, even a two, two, uh, 24 to 240, like that alley sweeper, give me everything kind of focal length. I love that as a walk around. And of course, a couple of speed lights. With this kit right here, I can pretty much do just about anything I need. So to start today, I think the best way to do this is I chose a story that I worked on, and I wanted to kind of walk through it and really break down some of the decisions that I made. So this story that I'm about to talk about is about the Great Lakes of North America. This is sort of a map and kind of a, a little grid here that gives you some of, the, some of the themes that I had to work with there. It's a 94,000 square mile area, so it's quite a bit of ground to cover. But you can see there's a lot going on here. It's a $6 trillion economy, sort of collectively speaking, so there's this big economic talking point. It's 20% of the world's freshwater. There's pollution issues. There's invasive species issues. There's culture things, all sorts of things. These are sort of the eight touch points that I was working with here. A lot of these, a good thing about the Great Lakes is a lot of these things sort of overlapped one another. So pollution and economy and, and invasive species, a lot of these things I could go to single locations and get a lot of bang for my buck, so to speak. So this image here, when I say finding the lines, I'm gonna talk a little bit about finding intersections where you can see direct change. So a really good illustration of this was if you were asked to photograph a forest fire and you weren't, you weren't there actually for the action itself, but if you were to go there after sort of an aftermath sort of an image, one of the best ways to doing it would be showing healthy versus dead, right? The burn line, that would there'd be like a very distinct line there that tells you a captionless story where you're like, okay, I get it. This is what it's supposed to look like. This is what it looked like after this travesty happened. In this photograph here that you're looking at, you can see a real collision between sort of urban society kind of melding into that whole industrial section that's right there on the, the perimeter of Lake Michigan. So you can see all of those houses and everything else, and then all of a sudden it's bam, oil refinery, bam, cement factory, steel yards, all these types of different things. An image like this really can sort of give a snapshot of like this is a little vignette of what it looks like to live around the Great Lakes. So that's what I mean by finding the lines. In an image here, you can see it's a real collision from marshland right into this little nuclear power plant in the background, so it's sort of humankind and nature, sort of a collision point. In this shot, which is a little bit flat, I shot this from a rooftop. I was hoping for a sunset that day, but instead we got socked in with rain. But this photo, from the story's perspective, actually really worked because this bridge right here that you can see how the trucks stacked up on, this is the Ambassador Bridge. It connects Detroit and Windsor, Canada. The talking point for this image here that was you know, used in the magazine was 7,000 trucks a day cross this bridge, and they bring something like $140 billion of cargo annually over that intersecting bridge right there connecting the two countries. So that is a dividing line, plus the little industrial section in the background. I just from a rooftop, I used a 500 mil lens, and I only had access on the roof for the one day, so I had to take the light I could get. But compressing that in, and really telling a multitude of sort of, you know, stories within one shot. There are a lot of converging lines. Algae blooms was a big talk, talking point for the story itself. Right here you can see, you know, shooting it from the air made a lot of sense because you can see this disgusting algae in this little harbor here. There's a boat pushing through. You can basically see, you know, a little bit of mankind and a little bit of nature and how messed up it is. And then pushing out even further and showing, you know, I'm actually on that little boat right there that's sort of cutting that line and that path through the water right there to give a little bit of scale and perspective. This algae bloom right here is about 600 square miles. It happens every year. It's getting worse and worse. I won't get too into the nuts and bolts of the actual story. But for, the, for the image, I needed to show perspective and show, like, look at the size and the scope of the issue we're looking at. 
And to get it vertical like this, this is just from with using a drone, and it's a three-stitch photograph. So I photographed the boat first, and I made sure it got into the place I wanted. I shot some photos, shot a, probably like a dozen photos. And then as soon as I got the photo I wanted, I just rolled the gimbal up and went snap, snap, stitched together later in Photoshop. So you can have like this panoramic vertical. And then getting on the ground and showing what it's like on the ground to continue this story to show like, look, this is how disgusting it looks on the shoreline and finding little polluted areas like this where people had discarded things like tires and little pylons, but also being able to feel the algae kind of moving into the shoreline. And to illuminate the, the little, you know, I'll get into more specifics about technicals after I walk, walk through the story, but just real quickly. Right here you can see I've used two strobes on each side to kind of illuminate that little bit of foreground just to bring it to life just a little bit more. And then lastly with algae blooms, getting underwater and showing what it looks like as these algae blooms start to form. Because effectively what happens is they cover the entire lake and they kill most vegetation and aquatic life that's underneath it. So I had to kind of time it to find like, okay, let's get a shot underwater, hopefully get some marine life in there and see what it's like as these things are slowly coming to life. You, you can faintly see the little tendrils coming together because these blooms happen fairly rapidly, so timing was pretty important. Back to finding the lines again. These algae blooms are really a direct result of agriculture that happens all throughout the Great Lakes Basin. It's the little pollutants that come off of the fertilizers and they run into the water. These things are not water soluble and we have sort of have this like long problem at this, in the Great Lakes. But this shot here, you can really see this is a fertilizer truck. I worked directly with this farmer to get permission to work with him for the day. I could see his path line, you know, like where he was gonna go. He, he basically went out into the field to do his job. I set the drone up and I found, I'm like, okay, I can see where he's going to go. And I just parked it and I just waited. And then as he rolled in, I made sure I wanted to compose that side of the, the left side of the photo where it's like, this place hasn't been watered, it hasn't been fertilized, just to show like this is the dividing line between what this person's doing and what it looks like if he's not doing that job. And then of course getting on the ground just to sort of continue the story to show what it looks like of what he's doing. He's standing in the wheat right here, kind of fixing his little fertilizer truck. And so after that I was like, okay, well what do they do with this wheat? So I came back about three months later and I went to a processing facility, which is really, really fun. Uh, right here, what they do is they take all the raw wheat. And so I wanted to kind of tell the story, like what are the phases you go through just when they process wheat? Because they turn it into flour and different types of ingredients for things. So what happens is they drive up and they open up these, the backs of these trucks and they pour all the grain down into the, to the ground here. And they get sucked up seven floors up into the top of a building. And then from there, they start the processing. So I wanted to get a detail shot to look what, okay, what does raw wheat look like? And so you can see here, this guy's holding like a bunch of raw wheat, but there's also little pebbles and things in there because this has come straight from the field. So he kind of wanted to show the steps of like, okay, what does it look like from raw to, to uh, refined? This is sort of a chart right here that they just had laying around in a lab and it was kind of samples of what the wheat's looking like and the different processes it's gonna go through. And then each one of these, some's gonna be flour, some's gonna be you know, turned into different ingredients that are gonna be shipped off, but just showing the phases. Now working in these facilities, the light's usually terrible, it's fluorescent lighting. So I just used one little EL1 strobe and just stuck it behind and just kind of gave it a little shadow and texture so you can really feel the grain. These are these gigantic turbines, think like giant paint mixer, where they stick some of the wheat in there and they just, it's a whole room of these things and they're just, they're like the size of a train car. And they're just on these motors sort of shaking around and what it does is it's beating the power, the wheat down into a fine powder. Well, in a, you know, in a two dimensional space, which is you know, what the still photo photograph is, you can't really feel, if, if I was to shoot this with a high shutter speed, like a 2,000th of a second or something, just freezing it wouldn't really give you the idea of what this machine's doing. So I chose to use like a quarter of a second to sh actually give it a little bit of motion, making sure I had a little bit of crispness somewhere in there. You can see it on the little, you know, pipes and things below. And I actually used a small strobe on a very, like a EL1 on a very low setting just to kind of freeze a little bit of the action, which I'll get into when we break down into some specifics. Invasive species is a huge problem in the Great Lakes, so I wanted to tell that story. Working in those little science labs, there are a lot of like bad lighting conditions like fluorescent lights, so I brought in strobes, and with two strobes, you can do a lot of damage. This shot here of this woman, she's holding a lamprey, which is this really gnarly sort of suction, so it's actually a parasite, these big parasites that latch onto fish. This lamprey here, they, they actually nearly wiped out 
all of the fish in all of the Great Lakes. The only lake that was spared was Lake Superior, and this was in the 60s. So they finally figured out a way to kind of get the whole thing under control. But I wanted to show like how menacing and disgusting these things are. And so they put some into a fish tank for me. You can see there's a lot of ice in there because they usually live really low in the bottom of the lakes where the water's quite cold. So, we, so just you know, using two strobes on the side just to illuminate the tank and show these fish, wait for a little moment where they're swimming around to give it a little bit of energy. And then of course showing like what that really nasty mouth looks like just simply using one strobe. And then going outside and going up the Illinois River, these are invasive Asiatic carp. They're all along the periphery of the lakes. These, these fish have not gotten into the greater Great Lakes yet. And there's actually these folks called the, they're called carp cowboys. And they work for about 360 days a year. And all these different, all throughout the Great Lakes, you've got these freelancers that are out there scooping up these fish. And, and they've got electric barriers so they can't get into the Great Lakes themselves. It's like a massive expense that each state has to pay every year, all to manage you know, this one bad invasive species that if it does get in the lake, it'll do a lot of damage. So I wanted to show these things in action and actually kind of bring them to life. And these folks are out there working in quite literally any conditions all year. And we happen to get really lucky and get a couple of really snow days that I flew in to go photograph. These fish were sort of, if you get the boats really close to where they're all conjugating, they start jumping out of the water. So for, as a photographer, that's kind of a nice thing is you can get in close and try to get a little bit of action and actually show them out of the otherwise murky water. Flooding being a huge problem, the idea here was to find compositions where I could show water breaking into places that was actually affecting the landscape. This is Chicago. This, this little lake walk here is normally like, you know, the lake's usually about three to four feet below but over the last five years, every spring, we get these massive floods. So I targeted areas that you could actually physically show and visibly show what it looks like when the water comes in. And I used, of course, a long exposure here to give it a little bit of motion and a little bit of smoothness along that little you know, scalloped area. And then, of course, getting underwater and showing, like there's little pylons in here. You can see that the water is much higher, trying to give a different perspective, not just go straight forward and, you know, Shoot from the you know shooting from the ground, but actually getting a little bit of an over and under. And then this this was a really lucky find. I was driving around in Port Clinton, and all of this water as it comes in, it's certainly affecting a variety of businesses. But I, as as the water starts to peel out, it's all wind driven because there's no tides in the Great Lakes. So you just basically get on an app and you follow where's the wind going to be that day, and that's going to push all the water over into whatever quadrant of the lake that is and that's where all the flooding is gonna happen. But as that wind recedes, it starts to kind of pan out. So a little bit of research goes a long way when you're trying to find storytelling photographs. So this here, I was, you know, this happened every day as the wind would shift, all the drains would kick in and they were trying to suck that water down and do what they're supposed to do, but all that water has to go somewhere. So as we started doing more research, we located a place where it does go. This is in Chicago. It's called the Tunnel and Air Reservoir Project or tunnel and reservoir project, and it's this massive network of tunnels where they effectively can take all of this excess water, process it, store it in reservoirs, et cetera, and reuse it. And so getting permission to get down in this place was a little tricky, but they did thankfully let us in. And to get in, they actually put you on, it's like a cage, almost like it's this big cage right here. You get inside of it, and then a big gigantic crane picks this thing up and then just drops you like hundreds of feet down into the ground. Well, to, from a photographer's perspective, you know, if you're looking up, it's a pretty tough exposure. So all I did here was we got dropped off down low, and then they were kind enough to let my assistant go back up and come back down, and I just used one single speed light in there to sort of illuminate the inside of the car, give it some separation from the actual tunnel itself, and actually spray out a little bit of light and kind of illuminate it. Inside, it's like miles and miles of tunnels that are 20 feet tall, just gigantic. So to get this photo here, you know, there is light in there, but it's kind of dim and poorly lit. It's functional lighting. So I just put a speed light right behind them to kind of give them a little bit of rim. And these speed lights just pop up quick. You can use them quick. You don't have to take people's time. You can just kind of work really efficiently. And then getting towards the end of the tunnel where they're still clawing their way through and expanding this thing. They've been doing it for like over 40 years. Or, and they have no intention of stopping. It's like they're just building these massive, massive networks. It's pretty cool. And so for this, speed light behind the tractor and another speed light right here, kind of off to the side. I like to keep my lights out of the shot. I'll get more into speed lights shortly. 
where we get really more specific. But just filling in those areas where those otherwise poor lights would be, give you a different look, but you'd also have to shoot at either really high ISO or use a tripod, and you wouldn't be able to freeze things very effectively. And then, of course, getting up on land and making friends with people locally. People in the Great Lakes, swimming is life. It's the Great Lakes. This is their ocean. And so going out there, and it doesn't matter if it's flooding, going out and just showing people euphorically enjoying the landscape. The shot on the left, one speed light. I just happened to see these kids playing and jumping off of these banisters, so I asked them if I could shoot some photos and just put one little speed light up there and got them doing flips. And of course, the cute little girl getting permission from mom and dad if I could take her picture. I wanted to also capture the landscape of these places because it's not all bad. There's still a lot of beauty to be had there. I got very, very lucky on this particular day with this massive super stealth storm sort of rolling across Lake Michigan. This is at the Sleeping Bear Dunes. And I knew this, I, I like to storm chase sort of recreationally, and I knew, okay, one, this was a very special storm, but two, this thing is going to angrily hit the shore at some point. And sure enough, it did, but you have to kind of hold position and deal with the fact that you're probably going to get rained and hailed on pretty heavily, which we ended up getting. But to capture a photo this dramatically, what I used was a, a split neutral density because the exposure between the sky and the foreground is you know, anywhere from two to four stops different. And I'll briefly touch on those. But it's really just a using filters effectively so you can go in and get like a more even exposure and not solely relying on dynamic range. This is a reforested area where they, you know, the, the logging and timber trade and fur trade in this area used to be the primary economy up in sort of the upper peninsula of the Great Lakes. And I just walking around this area, I found these little new sprouts that were coming up. And so two speed lights, wide angle ones on the ground, 15 to 35, and just, just to place focus on what I wanted the viewer to see. That's what's so great about, you know, using things like speed lights. And just some of the beautiful nature that takes place all seasons. This is in the fall. And I was, you know, I shot this photo a variety of ways, but what was really cool is if you sat there long enough, the leaves would slowly pool up, and then they would, like a little dam would break, and you'd get this little flame, you know, these little leaves that would fall down. So with the two-second exposure, it gave just enough to expose it, give the photo a little bit of energy. And I think this is the last shot of this series here. And just general beauty, this is just two, sp uh, two strobes on an underwater housing underneath, and I actually have one above pushing down. Now getting more into specifics, into more of the nitty gritty. Speed lights, I've mentioned them a few times. I'm not sure how many people in here use them, but they are the best, right? They're small, they're quick, they talk to your camera really quick. Just about every camera company makes them. I love the EL1s because they pack a lot of power and you can do so much with them. In situations like this where you have really dramatic skies, it's, they just can bring life into a photograph that it otherwise didn't have. So this photo here, this is the result shot of what that setup was. You can see there's one light on the side. My assistant over here is pointing one at the actual feature, but the other one he's actually pointing down more towards the foreground. It's hard to tell from this, this little BTS shot right here. But I wanted to illuminate that little section on the ground that kind of feels like bones like coming straight out of the earth. And also by doing this using speed lights, not only can I illuminate the subject a little bit, but it can actually drop the exposure in the background and make those storm clouds that much deeper. Same location, but this time with five speed lights. And the cool thing about these speed lights, too, is you can just stick them in little nooks and crannies, kind of hide them between all these little sandstone hoodoos. This big feature on the right, I think, is about, I'll call it 15 feet high, so it's like high-ish, but it's not gigantic. The speed light gives you a lot of light, especially in conditions like this when it's twilight. And again, kind of underexposing the background by about one stop and just spraying in a little bit of light. It's all controlled right off of the commander unit right on the camera. Getting low and just waiting for you know, something to happen. This is in the Kalahari Desert. I just, you know, if you get there early enough and you know where the meerkats are, you just kind of lay there on your stomach and wait. I'd photographed them before in the past, so I knew like eventually they're going to show up when they want to. It was kind of a cloudy day, so they're a little late that day. And I just put a little speed light on a tiny little tripod right off to the side, and I just sat there and waited. Then right when they came up, took a photo. I used a shallow depth of field here. I think I was at like F4, maybe F5, 6. That's the other great thing about speed lights versus mono heads, which I'll talk about as well, like Profoto B1s and everything else. The EL1 speed lights, you can drop them down to like a 1,000. The power settings, you can go really, really, really low, so you're not always going to need to blow out your subject. 
is this is a very short, you know, I'm probably two feet from these little meerkats right here, and I got lucky with the yawn. <laughs> and in a landscape setting as well, you know, forests, if you photograph in, the, in forests very often, you know, that dappled light can be really challenging. I've, I simply just waited for the sun to kind of go away, and then by using three speed lights, just threw a little light right across the foreground. Quick portrait setup. This is in uh, Kenya. These are Samburu children. These are little girls. They wear these beautifully like bead woven ornate outfits. And this is just two speed lights off to the side. And the best part of this, I didn't even have to ask them to pose. They have all these just natural positions that they hang out when they rest. And they just sat there. It probably took, you know, a minute to put the lights up real quick. And I just walked over and just, you know, 15 seconds. This is a pangolin in the Kalahari Desert. These are actually the most trafficked animal illegally on the planet. They, they're trafficked for the little scales, which is kind of a bummer. And uh, so to tell this story, we were really lucky to actually find a pangolin. And the tracker I was working with, you can see there's a little bit of blur on the, kind of right here, on the scales of this little pangolin here. You can see it was a slow exposure because the background's a little bit blurred. Basically what we did is I asked him to hold the speed light for me, and then he had a headlamp also in the same hand. So I actually had a light to focus on, and we just walked next to it, and I just, you know, he was kind of over me like this, and then I kind of crouched down and walked, and I just had the camera as low as I could get. We just photo, 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 waited, for, you know, for him to get into a good clearing. And that these photos were about a quarter second, so just a little bit of shutter drag, and that's what gave that little bit of blur. And the background is fine blurred. I just wanted to make sure the pangolin was sharp. And that little bit of light leak you're seeing there is just from that quarter second exposure from the headlamp. Which brings me to panning. Intentionally panning is a really great trick. So a motion pan, if you don't know what that is, say you're shooting at like a quarter of a second, and you've got like a horse running by you or a race car or something. It's just shooting a slow exposure and trying to maintain the same pace in which the subject is moving. If you do it with the strobe, it's a lot more forgiving so this photo here does not have a whole lot of energy to it. It's pretty flat, there's not like great depth of field, the light's pretty quiet, you know, there's not much going on. The strobe is helping, but it's still only sort of separating this runner here. But if you throw in a motion pan, all of a sudden you can give it a lot more energy. So this exposure was about an eighth of a second, it's two speed lights, I use rear curtain sync, which means, the, you know, let's say it's one second exposure, it opens, and then when it shuts, on the, when the curtain's coming back, that's when it fires your strobe, so at the end of your frame. And the reason you want to do that is because otherwise, you'll get her frozen here, and then the blur effect of her body will be in front of her, which you don't want. So rear curtain sync is really important for that. Here's another example. This was from a, one of those crazy Red Bull jobs years ago. This guy, Chris Sharma, wanted to climb a redwood tree, which is incredibly difficult. I shot it every variety of ways. I shot it without strobes. I shot it with lights here. And the photo just felt kind of quiet, even with bringing in a little bit of light. So with the pan, it actually brought it to light a little bit more. This is about an eighth of a second as well. The reason he's sharp and still is because of the light hitting him. You can see all the silhouetted trees more or less behind him. There isn't enough ambient light to really like blur through him that much. The, sh uh, the strobe did most of the work here. And you can do it in different ways. You can pan it left, right. You can either spin this. And so this photo here, actually on the right with the skateboarder, I think I shot that in like 98 on film. And it just, the spin sometimes works. It's basically just like a 45 degree turn. And again, rear curtain sinks so that you get the action on the backside so it freezes him on the backside of the spin. And you can see there's a little bit of light. It's kind of leaking through his face and that's just, that ambient light can kind of work in your favor. It actually gives it a little bit more energy. Whereas in the portrait on the right, there wasn't enough ambient light to really cut through his skin. And circling like that, it just works with the energy of the activity. Because this is on a half pipe, he's moving in an arced position. And just the way he was kind of positioning his bike just made it kind of fun to do it like that. You can also do it with a zoom. So this was with a 24 to 70 rear curtain sink again. This guy's high lining across the rocks right here. I started the shot at 70 mil and then just zoomed it out to 24. You know, I think this was a one second exposure. So you have to kind of time yourself 
but as soon as the flash goes off, it's gonna freeze everything it hits, and then all the city lights of Rio de Janeiro behind it kind of just like, kind of fingering out. Monoheads, of course, are much more powerful strobes. And I think an EL1 is like 100 watt seconds, roughly, whereas if you were to use like a Pro Photo B1X, it's about 500 watt seconds, so it's a much bigger light source. Right here, I have this guy on the rope for me is sitting up there, he's got two B1s on him, so he's about 1,000 watt seconds, and the reason I needed that much is I wanted to cover a really big spray of rock, but I also had to contend with the sun in the background. So you have to overpower the sun in order to expose it right, but then still sort of light up the climber himself. This photo here is kind of a bit of an illusion. I remember uh, when I shot it, I posted it on you know, Instagram, on social media, and uh, people were saying, it was like, this is a horrible Photoshop job, look at that reflection, blah, 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 which is kind of a compliment because this location was a really special find. So what this is, is this is actually, there's a dam, here I'll show you on the next frame. There's actually a small dam that acts like an infinity pool. And as a waterfall cascades down, the rock itself is about 100 plus feet from the actual dam and reflection itself. And you can see on the right, I actually have five B1s right there, just like a tremendous amount of light because it's a pretty far distance from basically the other shoreline to light this. But the result is, you know, you get this nice light that you're pushing over, but the reflection doesn't touch because those rocks never hit the water. So it's kind of like off kiltered which gives it this really kind of weird illusion. But again, that's just one big wall of light. And I always keep my lights at least at a 90 degree perspective, I should mention that. So if the lens is here, I don't want the, I want the light away from the lens because you're really working to get better. You want shadows, you, you, shadows are your friend. If it's right on camera, it's gonna flatten everything. So you wanna start, the more you bring those flashes and strobes around, the different look you're gonna get. This highlighter here, this was just an extremely lucky background. Just a rogue storm that kind of blew in off of the Atlantic and kind of hit us. For this, I used uh, two, uh, two monoheads, two B1s, one on each side of where his high line is anchored into the rock. And you can see this, the sun is right behind him. You know, I basically exposed, in this case, directly for the clouds. And then I adjusted the, the monoheads to sort of adjust so I could fill that in. You can see because the sun is right behind him, this would otherwise be a pretty bad silhouette. Multi-mode is something that is so fun to use. I don't really, maybe a lot of people are using it, I don't really see it much. It's something I certainly want to start using more of. But basically what this is, is a single exposure, and then your strobe will fire for a set duration of times. So this image here was shot in a gym environment where we kind of blacked out the wall, kind of turned it into a faux studio. And we had two EL1s, one on each side. And what it is, is you set the, the strobe into multi-mode, and in this case, each exposure was one second, so I said, okay, fire four, you know, four times in one second. And you have to have someone moving at a relatively fast pace, because if, if they're moving like this slow over the course of a second, you're gonna get just like a weird millipede look, and they're gonna be blending over one another. So it's a lot of timing and finessing, but if you get good separation, you know, each time that strobe fires, it's exposing that person on an otherwise black backdrop. This is what it looks at five strobes. I believe that's five. Two, three, four, five. And you can see there is overlap right where he's kind of oddly in the air. Looks like some weird like pro wrestling move. <laughs> but the, you know, you wanna make sure that your subject is moving at a decent pace. Otherwise you'll blend over it too much. And here it is at seven. And you can see there's a lot of overlap and you will start to expose over your subject. But if the cadence and the rhythm is right, it'll actually work out pretty nicely. And it'll give you this really, really cool and wild effect. Light painting, I think someone might have been talking about light painting earlier, but it's effectively just bringing in, it's not a strobe or it's not a mono head. It's basically, you can use, do it with a headlamp, you can do it with your phone. In this case, I did it with a big, a light about the size of this stage light right here that was like multi-million candle power. This is a pretty old photo from like 2006. And for this, I had to have the ice climber just stationarily stay there and kind of like tough it out. While I was up on the other side of him, I was remotely firing my camera. And then just with this, this light, just quite literally just throwing it down onto the wall and slowly exposing him. It's great for very large scale objects like a sequoia tree, which is you know nearly 300 feet tall. 
to actually go out and you know, it'd be really difficult to light something like this with speed lights or strobes. You'd also need incredible permission from the national park. So just a quick light, you can be really nimble. And again, keeping the light off at a 90 degree angle. And these, this is about a 30 second exposure, so it gives me time to paint from one side and just run all the way. I always run behind the camera so I don't accidentally like turn the light on and expose myself. And then get over and kind of paint both sides of this big tree. This is more or less just with uh, headlamps. This is a giant grousel tree at the foot of Mount Kilimanjaro. These trees are endemic to that area and they're really special, so I wanted to kind of capture that under the stars. And I have one person behind the tree kind of giving it a rim light. And then the two hikers there just really just holding their lights. And I think they held their lights on there for about four or five seconds and then I had them just kill them. And then I just let, you know, this is about a 30 second exposure so I could get the stars, but I only needed a little bit of headlight. With ambient exposure, any time the light is in your favor, I shoot in manually, manual almost strictly, especially with mirrorless cameras because you can see real time what you're getting. When the light is in your favor, don't even, just, just let everything else go to as close to silhouette as it wants. This was just a very lucky cut of light in the Himalaya where it just pushed over and illuminated this one little peak. You'll get a much stronger mood. This was a leopard that was just sort of laying in the road and we'd been photographing it and we were about to leave and another truck drove in and its headlights just pushed across this thing. And so, you know, to, to try and even out an exposure like this, it'll become really muddy and convoluted. It just loses its essence and its mood. So I was just completely focused on, on getting, making sure I was exposed just for the light I was getting off of the truck. And it kind of gave it this little stuffed animal, kind of like Tigger look. This is just ambient bounce light. This is out in the middle of nowhere, Argentina, in the salted desert, in like these mining communities. And this little cut of railroad tracks that is so polished from the, tr from the, you know, the trucks and the cars that move over this thing, that it was just reflecting the little dusty twilight in the background. But just honing in on the exposure of just, you know, I really was exposing for the tracks more than anything. And then here I used a, a two-stop split neutral density filter, which I'll get into in a second. And underwater, when some of your best light is actually at noon, which is kind of a gift, because it's never that way. And uh, just focusing in on just the light you have. Shooting in manual will give you all the variability to just focus on what matters the most. So for those not familiar, these things just live in my bag. These are split neutral densities. The soft grad, as you can see, it kind of gradients off a lot slower, whereas the hard grad is just like, bam, it's just kind of a hard stop. They're applicable for different scenarios. This with a flat line horizon, the hard's the way to go. But if you have mountains and other three-dimensional objects sort of in the way, the soft is the way to go. And the effect is essentially this. You can get an even exposure on your foreground, and then you can also get a really even exposure on your sky. So on this really beautiful stormy day, I actually used two for this. I used a 1.2 that went all the way down, so it gave me four stops of light from here to here compared to this. And then up here, I brought in a 0.6, which is another two stops, just to cover these gray clouds, which were much darker than anything else. So I actually stacked two in this case to get that result. This actually has three filters. I have a split coming in here. I used a soft grad. I think it was a 1.2, which is four stops of light. Brought it down to about here. And you kind of want it to peel off nicely down in this area here. That's why the soft is nicer. I used a polarizer, and then I used a neutral density, I think a three stop ND to give me I think four seconds. And all that water, of course, is just wave driven and it drains really quick. So you have to like time it. If you don't have a wide enough lens, stitch. Stitching is so much fun to do. This is Mount Everest. This is shot with a drone. I was actually flying, isn't there a laser on here? I should probably be using the laser. Hey, there it is. So I was right down here. This is advanced base camp in this little area down here. It's about 23,000 feet, so pretty high altitude. The drone itself is at about almost parallel with Mount Everest, like nearly 29,000 feet up. And I was, DJI was kind enough to give me like codes where I could have higher altitudes. And the fact that the drone could fly at that high, you know, at that altitude was pretty astonishing to me. But you, the lens it had on there was just not wide enough to capture the grandeur of this like massive mountain range. 
So this is actually 52 photographs. And so what I would do, and I would, I would just do it all manually. So I would shoot the photo and just move the gimbal. You know, like move the drone, move the gimbal. And it was almost like a scan. And I would just walk down and scan the entire thing. Stitching it was a nightmare. <laughs> to stitch 52 photos I'd never done before. I actually stitched it in strips. It was the only way I could do it. So I would take, you know, the strip, like this strip, stitch it all together, make it a file, come over, stitch that, stitch that, and then I stitched all of those stripes together at the end. But it did work out. Photoshop managed to handle it. But it's great. This, is, this photograph's only a couple weeks old, actually. This is from a recent storm chase. Even at 15 mil, some of these storms are just way too big, and they're, they're just, you need like a fisheye, which and that's not a look I wanted for this. So this was just 15 mil, like five photos. And you stitch it together and get these really wild shapes. And the lightning was just a very lucky get for this photo. I think that uh, Matt just talked about this a little bit. Getting low is a great way to kind of change your perspective, change your background. This was, I was with a, a guide in, in uh, South Africa, and he's someone I'd worked with for a number of years, and he actually, you know, he plays a little looser than most of these guides, and he let me actually get out of the car and hide underneath the safari truck. Hide is a loose term because clearly the lion sees me. But getting low and getting on the eye level of that animal, it gives it a new intimacy. And of course, those, you know, pin drop pupils have murder written all over them, so you want to be quick. Getting low again, using the negative space behind you. This was in Colombia. I was working on a project, and we were, it was all about birds. It was like a big ornithology film we were making. And for three days, we stayed on the side of this mountain. It was in a FARC, like an old FARC camp, which was like, you know, gorillas that used to do cocaine running and things. There's a bunch of horses that live on this property, and they're now kind of out to pasture. They're sort of in their retirement years. This, is, this whole area has been reclaimed, and it's now more of a natural preserve. And, but these horses do not like people. I, and this beautiful white horse, I tried to photograph it. Any chance I could, any time I'd see it, I tried to go out there and take pictures of it, and it would just run away. And on the third day, this is my friend Jose. He's, he's an ornithologist. He'd been probably watching and laughing at me over the course of these three days as I was you know, not getting the shot. And on the third day, it was our last day, he saw me walking out and he's like, hey, let me go out there with you. And he's like, just follow my lead. And he, he kind of walked out to the, you know, I let him, I gave him like 15 feet of distance and he slowly walked out to the horse with like his hands behind his back really gently and calmly. And then he just went down and he took a knee and he just sort of put his head down. It's like miraculously, like the horse just slowly, slowly walks up and starts sniffing him and I'm like getting all these great photos. The horse walks away. And it turns out his wife like trains wild horses. Like they have this whole facility down in Medellin. And uh, sometimes it's just approach, you know, and just no being with people that have a better approach than you is always helpful. And again, getting low gives you an entirely new perspective. This was in the Tian Shan Mountains, which is in western China. We were doing a climbing expedition there. And there's these Uyghur people that actually live in real turt and real yurts. They're nomadic, they're goat herders. And bringing our little, is that me? Am I over time? Nope. Um, luckily, I usually go over. And uh, it was fun. They were just really fascinated by our nylon tents. And it was fun having the kids and everything in there and some of the elders. And so just getting low just gives you a completely different perspective. So we see life at our normal height. If you can, it's great to get low, get high, change your perspective. You're going to get a completely different composition. Getting low is not always a fun thing. I had to sit in this icy cold water in a dry suit for, I kid you not, like at least 30 minutes just waiting for these penguins because they see someone laying in the water. They think it's like a leopard seal. They just don't like humans to begin with. They just want to kind of keep their distance. But for this, I just laid there in the water and just had to tough it out and wait as they slowly conjugated around. And then eventually all it takes is for one to sort of jump in the water and then the entire thing happens. So you kind of get one moment when that happens. But what I did for this shot here is I had, I had an underwater housing, and I had a little arm that comes off of it, and I had a speed light over here on a tripod, and I put it on what's called slave mode, which means this strobe here is the master, so when you shoot fire this flash, it hits the other slave, the other slave, the other strobe, which is in quote unquote slave mode, and it triggers it, it triggers it by light. And it's an old technique that's been around forever, and basically by doing that, the reason I needed a topside light 
was because you can kind of see in the water and the catch light in the, in the penguin right here that that little bit of light here was also illuminating and otherwise like kind of dark. It's a pretty drab day. Added, added a little bit of color into the shot. And then getting really low, I don't recommend doing this. This was, uh, we did a little snorkel dive for a few days with alligators down in the Everglades. <laughs> I feel you, man. I look at it now and I feel that. Yeah, at the time I had a different bravado. But yeah, getting down and getting, getting really low. The thing is, is it, it kind of gives you a, a little more of a perspective of what it's like to be that alligator and to be in that environment, to see things from this high. And we just got really lucky with this. The whole, this whole part of the day was just really lucky with the light beams and the way this alligator was sitting and everything else. But getting low, getting eye to eye. It's like if you're photographing your dog or your cat, shooting it from here is going to be completely different than if you put your camera, like, obviously at its level. Creativity on a budget. This is sort of the last thing I wanted to talk about. And I, I know I've talked about underwater housings and strobes, and that stuff's pretty expensive. My original over and unders were all done with a fish tank. And I got this tip from a guy, he's an associate press photographer named Mark Terrell. So I want to give full credit to Mark on this. Using a fish tank, it's, it's kind of a funny way to do it because, sorry, I've ignored this entire side of the room, by the way. Um, using a fish tank is a funny thing because you actually, you know, you're putting your camera right up against a fish tank glass, which is like a $10 fish tank. You can see on the photo on the right, I've got a split neutral density so I can, because you're gonna have a very different exposure above than you are below. But using this, you can actually put a split ND on there. The thing is, is when you're using a fish tank in the water, it's very buoyant because you know it's full of air, so it wants to pop up to the top. So you look like an absolute idiot. This was in a national park, so there's like people looking at me. You got this like ridiculous setup. But the solution's quite cool, or the, the result, I should say. So you can really, you can, you can do this on a budget. I mean, a five gallon fish tank's like 10 bucks. You can get it at any fish store or any you know, pet store anywhere and make really interesting pictures like this. You might get laughed at, but the results are pretty cool. Because an underwater housing is an arm and a leg. They're, they're usually more expensive than your camera body. And you don't want to buy one unless you're like committed. <laughs> and I wasn't committed at this time in my career. And the last thing I want to talk about is this shot here. This runner right here, you can see I'm using a strobe to light him up. But there's a little bit of atmosphere behind him. And this trick right here, I use a leaf blower, something you can get at a hardware store. Whoops. Advanced too quick. Can we go back? Just using a little leaf blower from like Home Depot, I'm just blowing dirt off the ground. It's just filling in the atmosphere. You can do it with leaves. You can do it even if you just want to shoot a portrait of someone and get a little movement in their hair. Just a $200 leaf blower. And what this ended up doing was it gives you this result. There's that little bit of atmosphere behind him that almost feels like it's mist or steam or something. And so most jobs, I usually keep a leaf blower in my car. And there's been, I can't even tell you how many times we've had to fly out for a shoot and I'll just like buy a leaf blower on the spot and then donate it at the end. But these little, these little sort of DIY tricks can really elevate your photography. And that is it. Oh my god, I thought I was going to go over. <laughs> Thank you. Happy to answer any questions. And we've got like 15 minutes, so let's talk. Um, just want to talk about, I guess, how you work in those conditions. If you go on any very remote expeditions and you're thousands of feet up with these guys, um, how, how do you approach that? You know, a lot of times when you're working with athletes, they're, they're the best at what they do, right? I'm there, I'm kind of like drafting behind them and, and working off of their expertise. So you do have to know what you're doing. If you're going to, rock climbing being a good example of this, it's dangerous. You have to understand. You don't want to be like a weak link being guided up into these places. So having a little bit of know-how is very important. And then once you, you know, know how to stay safe and keep up and be on the wall, you know, then it's really just the fundamentals of doing your job are, are, are like anything else. It's just a little bit more uncomfortable because you're in a harness. But what is specifically about your question? Is it because building relationships with these people is like key to getting access, right? That's sort of the, the stepping stone into that. And then other than that, it's really having a good understanding of the sport and knowing how to stay safe. If you're shooting trail running, you know, like we all understand gravity, so it's a little more basic. But if you want to shoot something that requires like, 
you know, working on a, a boat out in high seas or working on the side of a wall or something, you definitely want to have a little bit of an education so you're not being guided and taking away from what these people are there to do. But yeah. I don't know if that answered your question. Yeah, that's it. Thank you. OK, sure, of course. Um, which drone do you prefer, the DJI with the Leica uh, with the Hasselblad lens? Is that what you use? Yeah, I, um, I've been using those drones since like the Phantom 1. And um, the, these days, I just use the Mavic 3. Prior to that, it was the Mavic 2. And I used the, the Pro. When it was the Mavic 2, it was the one with the little, I think, the Hasselblad lens. And um, I, n I never used the zoom, but I've seen people do some pretty cool things with like the Hitchcockian effect using the zoom and everything else. But um, yeah, I, the Mavic 3 is phenomenal. Yeah, and it's so little, you know? It's, you can pack it easily. Battery life's great. Yeah. I don't know much about the career of a professional photographer. When you do these things, are you being paid because you're on a shoot, or do you take pictures and try to sell them? I'm usually being paid. However, in the early stages of my career, it was much more about shooting on what's called spec, you know, shooting on speculation, more or less. And that was really building relationships at the athlete level. My, the origins of my career were very much more about action sports. And all of that came in at the ground level, meaning I had relationships with people that were really good at what they did. Some of them had sponsors, so those were sort of target markets where I could maybe take photos of these people and then sell them on the back end. And then doing that enough, you start kind of getting more commissioned work. There was also magazines back then, too, so there were different markets to sort of sell those images to. And you get cozy with magazines and cozy with athletes. And the next thing you know, like, if an athlete's like, oh, I'm going to whatever location, I'm going to be there for a month, then I could, you know, and, and you're friends with these people, then I could try to pitch a story to a magazine. And if they said yes, then I'd start attacking their sponsors and be like, hey, we've got a magazine article for said magazine. Do you want to buy some advertisement? And then you would just sort of map it out like that. It's really getting as many bites as the apple as you possibly can. But it's just really a lot of hustle, a lot of relationship management, a lot of building like genuine friendships and relationships and things along those lines. I shoot recreational, recreationally as much as I can these days. It's a little harder. I'm a dad now, so I really would rather be with my son. Than, you know, but I still need to go scratch that itch every now and then. But most work nowadays is uh, more assignment based. Yeah, so the question was on the Everest photo, how did I stitch the clouds? I, I didn't have to do anything in post to fix the clouds. I was pretty quick, and I know that's a lot of frames. But bear in mind, I would shoot the sky first, then I would go low. And I'd go low. So the clouds weren't moving, I think, enough. Okay, I should actually look at it and see if there was, if you could actually see it. But I just remember in Photoshop, it didn't seem to, here it is. Yeah, the clouds didn't really need, I don't know. I think by the time I would kind of go across, and I was kind of scanning sort of left to right, right to left to do it. And then, of course, everything on the ground was uh, pretty stationary. What's cool about this, because I, I think I have a couple of extra minutes, this is such an interesting, so this is the China side. So down over this little, where, you know, right below where the dot is right here, that's where base camp is. That's about 17,000 feet. And you have to do this hike all the way up this glacier to get to here, and then you hop up to the saddle, and then you go to the top. And so from here, coming down this, these corduroy, you know, like, glaciers right here, they're incredibly dangerous. They're moving, they're constantly changing, exfoliating. It's getting hotter up there, so things are more unstable. This little black line right here, this is, there's another glacier back here. This is called the East Rongbok Glacier. This one over here, I believe, is the North Rongbok Glacier, maybe. And uh, what they've done is, as they're pushing down the valley, they're pushing like rubble and debris up onto the sides. And so this, you hike across this spine right here, and then you stay to the right of it the whole time. It's called the Miracle Highway. And it's without that upheaval of debris, you would, crossing this glacier, even if you could get around here, you'd still have to cross over to this side or come over the mountain, which would be much worse. And so this little piece right here, this, this panoramic kind of captures the Miracle Highway. And without a drone, you'd have to commission a helicopter in there, which would be like an outrageous amount of money meal to get permission to do it. But um, yeah, just drones have unlocked so much. 
But I just think that's always a fun thing to kind of point out for those who don't know much about this mountain, is uh, this little thing, the Miracle Highway. So it's what allows nearly everybody to climb the mountain from the China side. Yeah. Hi, question on uh, this one. Um, with the, you said you used the DJI for it and you had to get codes. I'm guessing that's for altitude or? Exactly, so without permission codes, the drone maxes out at 1,500 feet. Okay. And so I was flying from, we'll just call it 23,000 feet just to, for as a round number. It's a long way. And the other thing I didn't note is that by the time, I, I flew this path nearly every sunset. And some were really bad, this was the best one of the whole trip. By the time I would get on location to kind of get this big angle that showed all of that information right there, the drone was telling me like, you do not have enough battery to get home. So the first couple flights was really stressful. But then I say, as the you know, two weeks rolled by, I started to realize like, I got seven minutes. And so I knew I had enough time to sort of get a little bit. And so I would film the whole way up and try to get a little bit of video because we were doing sort of a, a multimedia project. So I'd get as much video as I can, and then I would usually get about two panoramics, and then I'd have to like get back with you know 1% battery. It was very stressful. You don't want to lose a drone in here. You'll never find it. Or even if you know where it is, you just are not going to go get it. It's too dangerous. I think you might have had one. Uh, yeah. Oh, great. <laughs> Since you, since you mentioned video, do you do video as well? Because the first sequence of images that you, that you show about the water, do you, you add music to that and it's an amazing documentary right there. Oh, thanks. Yeah, I, I do a lot of video. Um, it's, uh, I don't want to say it's 50-50, it's ebb and flow. Some years are, are more one than the other. But I love working in that mixed media format. It, um, when I got, I, I've been filming now for maybe 11, 12 years. It helped me become a much better photographer. You're, st you're telling two different stories. When you're filming, you know, you're waiting for something to sort of transpire within whatever you're, you're composed to. Whereas a still photographer is like hunting for an isolated sort of moment that matters. But the two, when you're, when you're filming, you still are, you're still composing with a lot of the same disciplines as you would as a still photographer. But when you're shooting photos, the problem is the conflict. Now when I'm shooting one or the other, I'm like wishing I was doing the other. But the, it, it helped me, this interdisciplinary situation, helped me to look at moments differently as a still photographer. And as, a, and as a filmer, it made me look at composition in a different way because film is split together, right? It's a series of clips, it's a series of shots. So you have to think broader story, which helped me tell broader stories as a still photographer. It made me realize like if it's, a, if it's someone's going in the shower, you know, you gotta get hand on handle, you gotta get rain coming. You can't just have like a wide, you have to really sort of dig in so doing both, I think, will strengthen you in a lot of ways. Not that that was your question, but just an interjection. Or doing a shot. How much preparation do you have to do, not just to get there, but to figure out how you wanted to shoot it and what was your time period? Because you have heights where winds are going to affect your drone. Absolutely. For this, a lot of this was luck. Um, Luck in, the, luck in the compositional sense. Luck in the sense that I didn't know where I wanted to put the drone. So the first few flights were certainly trying out different locations and being like, wow, that looks really pretty. That looks really pretty. This, this probably isn't even the best composition you can get in that area. I just found it and lived with it. And so when I got out to this point and I saw like, oh wow, you can see all the way down to these far peaks on the left, which is like Makalu, like some other famous 8,000 meter peaks, but then also get this really beautiful leading line I kind of like, once I found this location, which was maybe day two or three, I just committed to it until I got a, a really lucky, you know, this was, the, this was this wild sort of alpenglow sunset that only happened once. And there were many days where we just simply couldn't fly, just based on conditions. Because you quite literally are in the jet stream. Like when things get really bad up on these big mountains, it's because you're at, you know, 28, 29,000 feet. So, if the jet stream shifts, you're in good shape. But if it doesn't, you just kind of have to wait. Any other questions? All right. Thanks Keith, everybody. amazing. Appreciate your time. Some beautiful work. Thanks for having me. Thank you me. so much. Thanks for sharing. Sorry I talked Thank a you. lot.